Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really, really excited to be here. And I hope you are, too. Um, before we start, I would just like to alert you that today's discussion will be, uh, we will be recorded uh, so that this event can be shared online and uh, can be archived for future research purposes. So during the Q&A, and I hope it's an active one, I expect it will be, I just ask you to look for that microphone which is going to be passed around. And don't be shy, you might hate microphones, I do. <laughs> So um, just you know, have fun with it. Uh, use it as a prop, play Oprah, whatever works. <laughs> OK, so um, all right. Is Othello a racist play? Well, today's debate brings together a literary critic, a historian, and two superlatively accomplished theatrical professionals to tackle that. Well, very pro provocative, um, even iconoclastic question. And of course, we will be doing so in reference to the current groundbreaking, very innovative, uh, some are calling it historical, uh, the current production on at the RSC. Um, as far as the structure of the next 90 minutes, we're going to begin, I'm going to begin by introducing myself and my fellow panel members, three gentlemen with whom I am honored to be sharing the spotlight. Uh, for an academic, it's really exciting to be on this stage, I have to admit, <laughs> even though it's the smaller one. So, uh, and I'll confess to a bit of stage fright as well, so, but that's okay, it's all good. So, um, after the introductions, I will invite each of our uh, panel members, each of the three gentlemen, seated to my left to respond to this very provocative question and give his uh, reflections on the play, uh, on the play in performance, of course, uh, on the historical aspect of uh, Shakespeare's play and his representations of uh, others, uh, cultural others. I hope we talk about gendered, gender and otherness as well. Um, and then, of course, the theatrical aspect. Um, so uh, that will take, um, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then each, after each of uh, my colleagues here speaks, um, we will then open up into a more free-flowing just conversation amongst the four of us. And I, as I said, in the green room, um, I have some pre-written uh, questions for each of you. If you don't anticipate them in your initial um, brief uh, little um, uh, thumbprint comment. Uh, I will try to raise them in our discussion, but also I would like you to ask me questions and ask each other questions. So um, that's, that's what I have in mind here. Finally, of course, the culmination and climax of our 90 minutes will be your participation as an audience. And um, uh, let, me, let me begin by just uh, asking with a brief, uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have viewed this very exciting RSC production? Fabulous, oh, oh wow, okay. Ah, I gotta rein myself in now, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is good. This is really good news. So, um, good. Uh, Onyeka, you did not raise your hand. I'm raising my oh. hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shy. <laughs> Onyeka was my, was my seatmate in row D, uh, seat, uh, seat number 77. I hope to hear from people who are on the other side of the auditorium. I did not get to see much of Desdemona's face, facial acting, so please speak up. Um, okay, so um, who am I? Uh, I am professor of English at Florida State University, specializing in Renaissance literature, feminist theory and criticism, and critical race studies. And I have dedicated a sizable chunk of my work, both in the classroom and in print, on the representation of racial difference and sexuality in Shakespeare's Othello and in his works overall. Now, Othello as itself, Othello specifically, this Shakespearean tragedy, uh, this is a play that haunts me. 
is a play I thought I was done with. Actually, in, it's, two, it's already 10 years. Back in 2005, when I published this book, Racism, Misogyny, and the Othello Myth, Interracial Couples from Shakespeare to Spike Lee, uh, I thought I was gonna be done with it. I was not. I have sub subsequently talked about uh, uh, Virginia Woolf's a very interesting creative reworking of the play in her fanciful novel Orlando. And of course, here I am today, and having been at last night's production of Othello, I can promise uh, yet another publication or conference or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't stop. <laughs> um, so it haunts me, the play haunts me as a professional, but I also have to admit it disturbs me as a person deeply. It disturbs me as an anti-racist. It also disturbs me as a feminist. Um, it disturbs me as an American. And I'm going to be very conscious of my accent today. So maybe there's some Americans in the audience, are there? One? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do hope you speak during the Q&A, ma'am. Um, OK. As an American, as an American, the play troubles me because I'm all too aware of the pernicious ideological misuses or uses and misuses of the play. Um, its popularity in the antebellum South uh, worries me. The Othello burlesques, their popularity worries me. However, something that I want us all to keep in mind is that the, the role was a, originally scripted to be performed by a white man wearing black makeup. So the question remains to be asked to what degree, to what degree were original performances um, uh, were they prefiguring uh, that, that um, by now, fortunately, obsolete and crude literary genre known as the minstrel show? So this is a topic that, um, that we will all, uh, I hope, be, uh, be addressing. Um, so um, enough about me and my thoughts. I'd like to move on to introducing our, uh, my fellow panel members, Onyeka is, uh, and I, uh, because I study the Renaissance, people might think I do this a lot, but this is a first for me, Anyeka. Uh, he is a Renaissance man, a historian, a playwright, a novelist, a prize-winning novelist, a um, law lecturer, an activist, and a teacher. And most pertinently, pertinently to our discussion today, and I have another bit of show and tell here, he is an expert on the black population of Tudor England, um, thanks to this exhaustive and groundbreaking study. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is it, I think the number is 250,000, the number of artifacts and documents you had to wade through in order to produce this, uh, this intellectual work. Okay, so this is quite a first, and it's going to make an important, uh, it's recently been recently published, 2013, 14, I believe. Uh, it's going to make a big difference. And it's also today going to allow um, us to understand a little bit better, perhaps, um, the real life counterparts to Shakespeare's tragic more. Uh, as well as possibly to get us to wrap our heads around the question of um, Shakespeare's culture, the degree to which we can call his culture racist, uh, whether that term applies. <coughs> so thank you for coming, Onyeka, and welcome. Beside Onyeka, we have, um, well, <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone that almost all of you are familiar with as uh, a surprisingly funny and complex Iago, Lucian Masamati. Uh, I've been working on that. <laughs> Masamati. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, Lucian uh, brings to us a distinguished record of theatrical achievement. He is co-founder of Zimbabwe's acclaimed Over the Edge Theater Company, a group that performed, uh, has performed at the Ed Edinburgh Festival Fringe and other international venues. He is former artistic director of the Olivier Awarded Anglo-African Theater Company Teata Fahanzi, another, 
Okay. Uh, the name the name means uh, theater of emancipation, correct? Theater yeah. of the emancipated, correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Lucien. His UK stage stage credits include President of an Empty Room, Death and the King's Horseman, The Amen Corner, Pericles with the RSC. Speaking of Shakespeare, these were all, I believe, at the well at the National Theatre or the RSC. Um, as far as TV and film credits. Uh, credits, we have, of course, Game of Thrones, my personal favorite, and the number one ladies detective agency, the International Richard II. I'm just hitting highlights here. Um, so, thank you for thank coming, you. Lucien. We're excited to have you here. I am certainly Hugh Quashi, a long awaited Othello. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure many of you will say, worth the wait. Very well worth the wait. Well, in addition to all of the impressive credentials on his resume, which uh, you might have already uh, looked at on our, on our website, Highlander, Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, Ooh. Hugh Quarshi <laughs> is, I have to add on a more personal note, I can't resist this, the only human being, real or imaginary, represented by an action figure that I personally own. <laughs> <laughs> I only own one. <laughs> um, I, I first met Hugh in, of all places, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where he was the inaugural lecturer. Uh, this was 1998 at the Hudson Strode, for the Hudson Strode Program in Renaissance Studies. And in that venue, very interesting venue, because uh, the University of Alabama was until then infamous, a US institution infamous for its role in, uh, for its legacy in US uh, interracial relations, having been the site of a stand against desegregation in the 60s. However, the university was working to uh, correct that legacy. This event starring, starring Hugh, not in a uh, theatrical role, but an academic role, uh, an academic role that was praised universally by our graduate students as well as our undergraduates and the provost of the university as well. It was a smashingly successful lecture. The lecture's title was Second Thoughts About Othello, uh, something that I'm hoping that Hugh will be, yes, I'm gonna make you talk about <laughs> it <laughs> because this, this distinguished actor has had his uh, hesitations about the role and um, Maybe this is a, a, a good segue into asking you to speak sure. to today's yeah. topic, Hugh. Right. I, I resisted the role of Othello for years because it seemed to me that it was um, problematic in that the assumptions contained in the short story on which the play is based, uh, the conventions and the traditions, both literary and theatrical, um, just reinforced the notion that Shakespeare and Cinthio, the short story writer, were suggesting that black people uh, behave as they do because of their ethnicity. Um, now, it seemed to me that when the, the, a play written by a white man for another white man in black makeup um, wouldn't have any uh, issues with that. that. That was just a given. You'd be following the convention. And then actually, if you departed from the convention, um, you wouldn't, uh, you'd be denying the audience. A little bit like um, the Red Indians of John Ford Westons. You know, whenever you saw uh, a Red Indian ululating around the circled wagons, you knew that you know, that, that, was, that was what you went to see a Western for, the shootout between the, uh, the Indians and the white settlers. Um, and it seemed to me that the convention of the Moor in Eliz Elizabethan England on the stage, not just in Shakespeare's plays, but in other, in other plays like the Battle of Alcazar, Lust's Dominion, the Stukely plays, whenever a Moor appeared, that usually signaled something menacing or a threat to the uh, social, moral, and sexual order of society. Um, so uh, when a genuinely black actor comes to play the role, then it just seemed to me that it was important to be aware of the possible implications of the role um, and uh, resist any attempt to endorse what I thought might be racist assumptions. But look, let, let me, that was just to give the background to that, that particular essay. But let me try to address the, 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 the issue here. Is, is Othello a racist play? Um, to 
be fair to Shakespeare, we have to remember that he did not invent this plot. He adapted a short story by um, uh, Gerardi Cintio, uh, a Renaissance writer, um, who, uh, and this is one of the short stories in his Gli Hecatomiti, I believe. And um, um, the, uh, the interesting thing is, you have to remember, in other words, that Shakespeare was um, committed to the same plot structure as Cintio's. In other words, the black general ends up murdering his white wife. Um, the interesting thing is the changes that Shakespeare made to that, uh, that short story in order to get from uh, A to Z, so to speak. And um, the, uh, one of the interesting things is, of course, he invented certain things like the character of Rodrigo, he invented the storm, he invented the Turkish fleet, he invented the fit. Um, but um, what he uh, also invented or introduced was the racial epithets and the, uh, the rather fierce racial epithets, thick lips, sooty bosom, um, what she'd fear to look upon, um, the, the constant references to uh, uh, Othello's appearance. Um, so it's arguable then that um, although he was constrained by the original um, short story in plot terms, he was liberated when it came to introducing the, uh, the, the racial language. Um, now I know, of course, it's, it's a mistake to attribute the views of a character to the author, necessarily. But um, when Shakespeare says, when Shakespeare ha has Iago say, these Moors are changeable in their wills, and then goes on to demonstrate precisely that, um, then I think it's fair to to, to um, ask, well, was Shakespeare being a bit of a bigot here? Uh, the question arises also, did, did Shakespeare know any black people? Could he have known any black people? And the answer is yes, he could have. There were, I think it's been established, you probably know your colleague, Do Dr. Miranda Kaufman, who's written a book called Black Tudors, and whom I, I interviewed for a program that I made for Radio 3 about uh, Othello. And she's established through parish records that there were several hundred. Uh, well, she has um, records of um, bet two, between two and 300 black people on parish records, but that implies that there was a much larger black population in Elizabethan England. Um, there were three ambassadorial visits from ambassadors from the, uh, the Barbary Coast states, um, because of course they had a common enemy in uh, Philip II of Spain. So the, uh, the, the North African states, it was in their interest to form an alliance with Elizabeth I. So um, yes, Shakespeare could have known some black people. The question in my mind is then, did he do his homework? Did he bother to get to know any black people? If he didn't, was he being lazy? If he did get to know some black people and still wrote the Othello of the second half, who does become um, an obsessive murderous honor killer, was he being a bigot? Um, because he, the Othello of the first half is certainly magnanimous. He's astute, he's mature, he's experienced, he's wise. Um, and then in the space of a single scene, the so-called temptation scene, Act 3, Scene 3, which is admittedly a long scene, he is persuaded that his wife has been unfaithful. Um, and not simply that, but that he should then murder her or um, execute her. Um, and, and so, and, but there are only, although it's a long scene, there are only about 300 lines in the text as, as written between Othello saying, perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee, and when I love thee not, chaos is come again, to his saying, barely 300 lines later, now do I see it is true, look here, Iago, all my fond love, thus do I blow to heaven, it is gone. Now, the worry in my mind is that happens very quickly. Um, and perhaps the, because of the convention of the Moors being um, perceived to be uh, prone to jealousy, to uh, irrationality, to violence, that somehow was the, the subtext. Well, those Moors are like that, aren't they? That explains the rapidity of this uh, transition. Um, and there again, that's, that, that gave, gave me pause for thought. So um, 
The, the idea, too, that... Um, just going back to the idea that Shakespeare... Did Shakespeare do his research? And it's widely thought that he read uh, John Poorer's translation of the uh, geographical history of Africa by a man called um, Leo Africanus, um, in which he did make the point that no nation is so subject unto jealousy, uh, talked about the blemii, the, the men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. But the more interesting thing is that he, he picked up the sensational bits of the story, but the more interesting thing was the author of, of that story. Hassan al-Wazan was his, re, his original name, a man who had been um, uh, expelled from um, Andalusia in, I think, 1492, had traveled extensively through Africa before being kidnapped by uh, pirates and uh, given as a as a hostage or a gift to Pope Leo the Tenth, <laughs> one of the Leos, <laughs> who, who then uh, baptized him as uh, um, Leo Giovanni Africanus. So, um, but that arguably was uh, he arguably was a more interesting template rather than the sensational stuff that he wrote for his European audience. Now, um, we have to credit Shakespeare with sufficient imagination and intelligence to to know that. Uh, what he read wasn't necessarily true. And certainly the Othello of the first part goes against the grain of the, uh, the Moor uh, as established on the Elizabethan stage. But then it, it is as if Shakespeare stretches the, the, uh, the, the bowstring very tautly and that, so that when he releases it, the arrow flies very fast and very violently, violently to its target. In other, in other words, he, uh, he um, goes against the grain of characterization, but only to have Othello revert violently to type in the second part. I will chop her into messes, cuckold me, um, and, uh, and so forth. Well, as, as, as you know, we, we've played it. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, so uh, um, the, the more, uh, ultimately, the, the question is, um, what do we mean by racist? And to my mind, it, um, it's fairly simple that where race becomes the prime, if not the sole determinant of character, of value, of, uh, of moral value. Uh, and the suggestion, any suggestion that a character behaves as he does because of his ethnicity is by definition racist. Any suggestion that a character behaves as she does because of her gender is by definition sexist. And, and so on, you, you, you get the point. Um, but um, I, I think there are degrees of racism. You know, I think sometimes you have to try a little harder not to be racist. I think, come on, Jeremy Clarkson, you could have tried a bit harder <laughs> when you said eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch it by his toe. You know, that, I think, um, was uh, lazy, casual racism. Um, it seems to me that um, there's racism by commission and racism by omission. And I would... I think my conclusion would be that Othello is racist by omission. And I say this because it seems to me that Shakespeare ultimately isn't that interested in Othello's psychology. I think he, where the point that he wants to get to quite quickly is the seismic eruptions of emotion, the, the Othello music, what's become known as the Othello music, the, um, the elaborate verse like to the Pontic Sea and... Uh, you know, his, his great um, speeches. Um, why do I say he's not that interested in Othello's psychology? Because Iago has twice the number of soliloquies that Othello does. Iago's soliloquies enable him to engage directly with an audience in a way that Othello's soliloquies don't. Put out the light and then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me. He's not talking to the audience, he's talking to a light. But once put out thy light, thou cunning pattern of excelling nature, he's not talking to the audience, he's talking to the sleeping form of Desdemona. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, Othello's um, soliloquies don't reveal very much about him. He doesn't, he's not allowed to develop the same kind of relationship with the audience as Iago does. Um, Othello is, if you like, one of the, um, the victims. One of, if, if Iago is the cause, then... Othello is the effect. Um, it seems to me that Shakespeare could try, have tried a little harder to, um, to allow us to um, enter into the mind of, uh, of Othello, but he didn't. 
um, and I think he resorted to a kind of comfortable, complacent attitude where I don't have to explain very much about, about these moors because everybody knows what the characteristics of the moors are. Which is why in our production, uh, we have uh, attempted quite assiduously to avoid any conclusion that Othello behaves as he does because of his ethnicity. Um, not simply because of the casting of a black Iago, but also Iago is subjected to, well, those of you who saw the production, to a, a fairly harsh interrogation. <laughs> mm. um, and um, it's, uh, it, at every point, it's made very hard for Iago to, to persuade Othello to put his plot into effect. Um, and, and by the way, the, the, um, the fit in our production was not an epileptic fit, but for those who um, aren't familiar with medical terminology, it was a transient ischemic attack, a mini stroke, <laughs> which um, um, can often change the, uh, the brain structure and the personality. So we, were at, we went to some lengths to try to um, uh, pull the play back from suggesting that Othello is gullible because of his ethnicity. We tried to make it much harder for Iago to persuade him and therefore to make uh, Othello less of a fool and to make the play less racist. But so yes, in conclusion, it's, um, it's a, a play that's racist by omission rather than commission. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Lucien. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Kwashi. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, I am um, going to preface my comments by saying, firstly, that it is almost impossible as a practitioner to have any sense of objectivity, simply because, regardless of what people think or feel, every night you have to live with this. Every night you have to deliver it truthfully, honestly, and with integrity. And when I was first approached about this project, I made a very concerted effort. And I remember sitting with Hugh and Iqbal, uh, the director, um, who uh, they arrived with all these fantastic tomes of books. And I said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested because, first of all, I don't think that Iago knows he's in a tragedy. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, <laughs> He's a man who is reacting to the fact that his friend has passed him over. That is, that is all that I'm interested in at this point. I think also, though, it is very, especially when it comes to uh, the classical canon, if you like, there is so much opinion. There is so much uh, nous and so much just noise around it that it is, it is, uh, it is almost impossible to have an, an original way in. Uh, as it were, and a lot of opinion has be then become fact, or become accepted as fact. Anyway, that aside, in my own uh, dealings and, uh, uh, if you like, uh, existence within and without and beneath the skin of this piece, it is my feeling that the play is not a racist play. However, it does lean very heavily on racism. I think it uses it sometimes very casually and very easily for dramatic effect, um, which, again, it's impossible, in a sense, to second guess the author because he's not here. Uh, <laughs> but there is, a, and there, there I do agree with Hugh's uh, point that you know, oh, you could have tried a little bit harder. You could have tried a little bit harder with that. However, what I what I think has become uh, accepted, and what I hope our uh, our production is is challenging. And I think over the years there have been very racist interpretations as a result of what has been established here. Uh, uh, to the point where uh, you know, even the way the role is performed <laughs> or has been performed is influenced by what a distinguished actor X, Y, or Z did in 19 what have you. And there is no deviation or slipping from that. That is what has become accepted. Which leads me, actually, to a very interesting revelation point of discussion within myself in, in dealing with all of this, which is that uh, who is, whose prejudice is it anyway? Hmm. Who's, who, who, who owns the culture? From whose perspective is it, are, we, are we sitting and going, well, this is racist because, that is racist because? Is it uh, simply that we back certain arguments because they defend or uphold or bolster a certain status quo? Or 
is it that we accept simply because, well, you know, um, that's just the way it is, that um, Othello must always be black and Iago must always be white, just because that's just the way uh, that it is. Um, and I would like to believe that certainly with, with our production, that we have started to challenge the notion of cultural ownership. I remember saying recently, uh, speaking to a group of students, I was, uh, I was born in the United Kingdom when my parents were studying here. I was raised in Tanzania and Malawi and in Zimbabwe. When you take uh, any book or any play from the library, nobody has any control over what happens within your mind and within your soul. To therefore suggest that a 16-year-old Zimbabwean uh, who opens a play and goes, it was Merchant of Venice, actually, and goes, wow, this is really cool, this is exciting. To therefore tell that person that, well, actually, you know, you can't play uh, Shylock because your skin is a bit too brown. Uh, actually, you, you, you might find Hotspur very interesting, but no, no, that's, you don't own that. You can't have that. That, I think, is racist and dangerous. And that cuts through the entire culture and society that we are living and working in now. Because, you know, I, as an artist, as a creator, I dive in with everything that is within me. I don't go, oh, look, Iago is white. I didn't need to white up to play Iago. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need to go and live in the home counties, you know. <laughs> you know, I responded to what was on the page. Similarly, if uh, I, I was having a, a chat with one of our cast members, Jacob Fortune Lloyd, Lloyd a brilliant actor who's playing Cassio, who, because of some time he had spent in, uh, in Uganda, in his gap year, came to me half-jokingly saying, you know, I'd really like to play uh, uh, um, Othello one day uh, because I, I'm, I'm seeing it as, as this, this, um, this white man who walks into this uh, Ugandan school village situation and he's the only one sticking out and I would, I would transpose the word more for Mzungu. Uh, which is the, for those of you who know Bantu languages, Mzungu is the white man. Um, and I went, yeah, go for it. Why ever not? That's, you, you know, you, you, you have a way in with originality, with integrity that is true to the story. Why ever not? Nothing is broken. This is, we own all of this. This is ours. It is ours to challenge, it is ours to push, and it is ours to refresh for those that are uh, to come. I thank you. <laughs> And we thank you, Lucien. Okay, wonderful. Um, Onyaka. It's a bit like coming on stage after James Brown has been on concert. <laughs> <laughs> the, Rolling, <laughs> the Rolling Stones uh, watching uh, James Brown perform and then, oh, we've got to go on stage after. <laughs> okay. Well, my journey, uh, in a sense, um, I think is where I'd like to start um, because um, I was born in this country raised in this country, lived most of my life in this country. And uh, Othello is the, one of the first people that you come across um, before Martin Luther King, before Marcus Garvey, before any of these Malcolm X. You come across Othello. Um, for better or for worse, you come across Othello. When you're 11 or 12 and your mind is open, you know, Shakespeare is the first thing that's pushed onto you. It so happens that in my case, I kind of enjoyed it. And, uh, but at that initial stage, when I initially read it, when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I rejected it. There are notions and ideas and concepts in it that initially, when you first read it, when you first think about it, they seem quite abhorrent, um, quite negative, quite stereotypical. That notion stayed in my mind for about a year, I think, a year, two years, till I was about 14 or 15. I'm much older than I look, actually. Until <laughs> <laughs> I was about 14 or 15. And then later on, when I was about 16, I revisited it. Now, I revisited Othello through Aaron. Mm. Aaron is a character in Titus Andronicus, who's also a Moor, and also written by Shakespeare. And when I was reading speeches of Aaron in Titus Andronicus. You know, coal black is better than another hue, and it scorns to bear another hue. For all the water in the seas, white ocean can never turn the swan's black legs to white. You know, all that stuff. You know, um, and uh, where he says, um, when a white person, white character, blushes, uh, he says, um, a five treacherous hue, in reference to the whiteness, that will betray with blushing the deep enacts and consoles of their mind. 
He was a lad famed of another Leah, yeah? And that kind of thing. So this, this character, Aaron, was a very powerful character written by Shakespeare. So I was reading these words written by Shakespeare. I thought, OK, so this character called Aaron is written by Shakespeare. And he says all these things. Of course, he dies at the end. But he dies at the end. But <laughs> let me think and go back to Othello. So this making me revisit made me begin to reanalyze him. But I still wasn't quite happy. It took me another three or four years, and I began to read other plays, Renaissance plays, etc., etc. And then I turned about 18, 19. I was studying law at the time. So I thought, let me do some research. You know, people can just keep repeating the same thing. Things of darkness. Black people was the other. Black people were strange. Black people were slaves. Oh, there weren't too many, you know. They were all slaves, though, but there weren't too many. Kind of a contradiction. So I thought, OK. And everybody's reading, writing the same thing. Historians write the same thing. English majors write the same thing. No disrespect. Actors and actresses <laughs> say the same thing. <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, it must be the truth. So I'm 19, 20, and I thought, OK, let me do some more research while I was studying the law. So my research started not with all these books. I did what you did. I put that to one side. Then let me do some real original research. And it took me another 20 odd years of research. Yeah, 20 odd years, right? Which I probably wouldn't have done if I'd known that was going to take that long. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the first thing that I did is I went to places where you wouldn't expect to find what you needed to find. So I went to parishes in rural areas like Holt in Worcestershire. Holt in Worcestershire. Yeah. <laughs> Hatherley in Devon. Country places. Uh, and in those places, I found Africans, people of African descent, described as black or moors, described sometimes as Negroes, not, occasion, not often, but occasionally, sometimes as Ethiopians, or sometimes just as black, often referenced by their African ancestry, coming late from Barbary, we're going to talk about the word Barbary perhaps later on, or coming from the Iberian Peninsula, or coming straight from West Africa, it isn't just a case of North Africa. Be clear. It isn't just a case of North Africa. In fact, there are more West Africans present in Tudor society than North Africans. That's what I found. And West African princes, too, also present in English society. So this research, I put to one side of my thought process. And then when I revisited these Renaissance plays and, and uh, stories, I had a different context. Some of the stuff also I began to explore, written by Englishmen at the time. George Best in 1579 says that he himself in England has seen a relationship between a white woman and a black man with the child produced his words, as black as the father is, expunging the white blood, the good white blood of the white mother. Meredith Hanmay in 1571 says something very, very similar. So there is that negative influence there. But there is also a positive influence too. And just as um, we try to evaluate what was in a 16th century English person's mind, we must begin to evaluate our own perspective. Because here in this society, we have a negative and a positive inscription. We would not like to feel, perhaps, that Nick Griffin, the British National Party, the UK Independence Party, Enoch Powell, and all these other politicians is the definitive definition of 20th and 21st century ideology. And then we try and reinterpret the plays and things that are produced here with entirely that perspective. Is there no other perspective? Just so that voice is loudest and noisiest? Does it mean that there is no other voice present in 20th, 21st century politics? Or 20th, 21st century lives? Most people in modern society have very little connection with political rhetoric and spend most of their existence existing with each other. And what I found in the English records was this, that the way in which white people in Tudor society, notice I say Tudor, 
I didn't say 18th century. I didn't say 19th century. I said Tudor society, the way in which most people interacted was on a very local level, a very individual level, a very personal level. Nothing sensationalist about it at all. This was a very important thing for me to discover. And it also made me revisit these plays because when I'm not an apologist. I'm not an apologist for slavery, martyr, genocide, or any other thing anti semitic I'm not an apologist. If I see it, I see it. Right? But it made me revisit it because then what I began to understand is that the English people in Tudor society did not understand what race was. That was the first thing that I understood. And nobody was saying it. They did not understand race. They had no concept of what we now understand it. Because they would say that the French are a race. The Germans are a race. The Spanish are definitely a race. And those (laughs) Catholics, they're a separate race to us once we become Protestant. Of course, when we're Catholic, we're the same race. Right? Right? That's how they understand it. Right? So the, so the play is not racist I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They didn't understand race. But they did understand difference. Ah. Okay. And they did understand colour. Because they could yeah. see colour. Right. And they tried to make sense of difference. And colour. And language. And most of the time they couldn't make sense of it. So their ideas were all jumbled up. So they would look at, um, for example, with difference, they would say, and in terms of color, they would say, okay, you over there, right, and you here, your skin is black, right? It is black because of the sun. There was a school of thought from certain English people that this was true. Thomas More, famous Thomas More, Man Full Seasons, right? He talks about the blackness of Africans here and elsewhere. Yes, he does, Thomas More. And he concludes that this blackness is nothing more than the sun. And he concludes, wrongly, that a child born to a black man or black woman here in England will be born white, because <laughs> lack of sun. And that a child born from a white person in Africa will be black because of the sun. Not only Thomas More think that, Francis Bacon in 1620, also says the same thing. Thomas Brown in 1646 says something very similar. Yes, and Robert Boyle in 16, about 1660 also says something similar. So there's that school of thought. We may, may think that's rather quaint. But the point is, they don't have a concept that the blackness is something deeper inside. That the blackness is only skin, skin, deep, skin deep. Other people like George Best for nefarious reasons says that the blackness is the curse of Ham. He says that these people are born black and the blackness runs deep inside and as a result of the curse of Ham. But he's not sure. He says this because he's observing black children being born when the black father and the white mother are into a relationship and the child is born black in England. And then looking at that, he tries to make sense of it and says, oh, in the theory of monogenesis, which is the idea that all of humanity originates from one family, the colour of that original family must have had some colour. He doesn't know whether that original family was black or white. He sees a child being born black in this country, and he therefore concludes, worryingly, if that's so, perhaps the original family was black. Oh, but that can't be true, he says. Right? Because then, that would mean that I am the other. (laughs) And I don't want to be the other. So it must be that I am the original. And that the black is the other. But he's not sure. So what I'm just trying to highlight is that at this time, we are thinking that they have a concrete understanding of these things. I mean, we don't understand them now anyway. But... We think that they have a concrete understanding. They do not have a concrete understanding. So the play is not racist. No. (laughs) (laughs) The ideas are movable and changeable. The concept of racism. Yes. This idea, racism is often talked about, often misspoke, I think, right? Because the actual definition of race is something which is relatively modern. 
Francis Bernier in the 17th century, the end of the 17th century, long after these plays were written, began to try and figure out what were the nations of peoples. He defined this along colour and then related this colour to the theory of the four humans. I don't want to get too academic in it, yeah? So he said that there is a white race, which there isn't. He said there is a black race, which there isn't. He said there is a red race, which there isn't. And he said that there is a yellow race, which there isn't, right? Well, there are no races. Exactly. There are no exactly. races. It's a social construct. That's right. But he says that these four colours, these four colours are related to the theory of the four humours, phlegmatic, sanguine, etc. He doesn't necessarily attach a negative reference. There is a positive reference to Othello's humours made mm, by yes, Desdemona. Yeah, like, right. Do you have yeah. that quote on I, the top I, of your I head? I think the I don't, son where the he was born drew all such humours from him. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes, the jealous humours mm. should have been drawn from mm. Othello by the son yeah. of his of yeah. his. And uh, there, is, there is a view that actually the, um, the African race was um, actually calmer, more collected yeah. than, right. than the yeah. European And race. these are yeah. conflicting paradigms, yeah. Yeah. and they're both, you can find mm. each of them at work in Shakespeare's play. Mm. Mm. But these ideas are later than Shakespeare. Shakespeare, these ideas come about later in the 17th mm. century. It isn't until the 18th century that you have ideas from Linnaeus, from John Frederick Blumenbach, which conjured up ideas of definite racial, racial categories. Now, what we do in the 20th and 21st century, which is entirely understandable, is that we then overlay our 21st century ideas of everything that's right. gone before. Fascism, Nazism, um, slavery, and Lynchings. all those different things, including the transatlantic slavery, and then we place it back on the 15th and 16th century where it shouldn't necessarily be. Okay. That doesn't mean that there isn't prejudice there, but it, doesn't, it does mean that we don't have the racism that we think is there. But that doesn't mean we can't play it like that. We can play it with issues of race because we're living in a society in which racism is playing a daily part in every one of our lives. But whether it's in Shakespeare's mind, I extremely doubt it. Can, can, so I, ask I, you, yeah. can I ask you a question? <laughs> um, we're talking about interracial breeding, and you talk about white babies, black babies. Uh, something that I was um, very um, interested in in your book, you made the point in your introduction that in your research, you found more evidence for interracial unions featuring, uh, involving an African woman and, and a white male. Yes. Now, this is, we're talking, now, now we're talking about the photo negative of Shakespeare's play featuring a black man and a white woman. So my question, I guess it's, it's, it's for all of you, in fact, yeah. uh, is why all the fuss about Othello? Most people, and I, in, my, in my teaching, I've encountered this. Mo most people, when they think, oh, interracialism, uh, racial relations, interracial marriage, they think Othello. They don't think Antony and Cleopatra. So, so what it is it, and I'm asking the three of you this, so let's maybe hash it out. What is it about this myth that keeps haunting our culture. I, I believe, and it's something which we discussed uh, <clears throat> uh, early on, and I may be misquoting Gary Young when I say this. So apologies, I know it's on camera, apologies, but I think it was a very ob uh, astute observation that there is within a certain strand of quote unquote white society, there is uh, the tendency to put uh, either the black man on a pedestal, Nelson Mandela, or to put the black man underfoot, the poor wretched uh, who are trying to get through the Euro tunnel. But there is never a place at which we are equal. And I think somewhere, somewhere within the psyche is, uh, <laughs> to, 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 uh, to quote uh, a, a 1980s rap, uh, um, fear of a black planet mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm. There is this, there's a real kind of, uh, I don't know, it, 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 it's, to put it in another context, because I sound like I sound and look like I look, when I go to the schoolyard on the school run to take my children uh, to school, there are certain parents who don't know what to do when I open my mouth. <laughs> they, really, they really don't, they do not know what to do. They don't, or they, oh my goodness, he's black, but he's Speaking in compound sentences. Um, <laughs> um, 
I don't, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that for comic effect. It's the truth, you know. <laughs> I stand there and, and, and they walk away because there is within, uh, within a certain uh, strand, within our society, uh, a, a sort of, this is, we compartmentalize. That's what they are like. That's safe. That I, I can understand. I cannot understand a black man who knows Tchaikovsky. I don't, I don't get that. You know, so I think, uh, I think there is, there is uh, something of the fear and loathing of the exotic, perhaps. I don't know. Well, mm. that, that binary that you're mm. talking about is also true of um, <laughs> traditional attitudes toward women. She's either a virgin or a whore. Mm. She's either a good woman or a bad woman. Mm. Desdemona flips over mm. as well. We, we haven't talked about her yet. I, I hope we... I hope yeah. we have time. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, can, can I ask an, another question to all of you? Unless, unless, Hugh, you would like to respond to the first question at hand. Yeah, um, I, I have to um, agree with on, on, on Yekin. My, my um, uh, reading suggests that um, the ideology of racism didn't develop until the slave trade was in full swing. In full swing, And that was in, you know, in the mid-1600s. Mid yeah. Um, and when, when there was, I, I think, a concerted, um, well, I don't know if it's concerted, but certainly the tendency was to dehumanize uh, black people in, in much the same way that the American soldiers dehumanized the Vietnamese, I call them gooks or Charlie and so forth. And, and similarly, uh, black Africans were less than human. Um, so, yes, yeah, so technically speaking, uh, um, Shakespeare then can't be said to be a racist. Um, in that he, he wasn't evolving racist ideology. But that's why I, I use that curious phrase, racist by omission rather than, <laughs> rather than, than, than commission. But that said, um, you, it's, um, you remember in, in um, Gary Taylor's book, Reinventing Shakespeare, that Shakespeare became uh, um, as prominent as he was after the Restoration yes. because you didn't have to pay anything to stage his plays. Yes. Um, and yes. um, uh, it, it seems to me that um, the popularity of uh, a place, particularly like a play like Othello, is that it, the opportunities that it presented for um, an actor, of course, invariably a white actor in black makeup, to to um, demonstrate his chops, just to, to show what what, uh, what he, he could do. So it became a popular. It was a very popular role, I think, amongst audiences and and actors. So there's a kind of historical accident there. Um, and then the, the combination of the popularity of the role with the uh, development of the slave trade, um, that, it, that seems to me to suggest to um, um, elide into uh, something that goes against the grain, um, you know, the, 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 the sexual menace of the black man, um, the, the denial of the history of, of the, the black man. And so, I fetch my life and being from men of royal siege, says uh, Othello, as much as, um, Orunoko in, in Afro Ben's yes. uh, play. Um, so it, the, the play has developed a kind of mythological uh, status, mm. which it perhaps doesn't deserve. And, and we tend to do this with Shakespeare plays, that yeah. we look at his plays, they, they, are, they sometimes become a distorting prism, yeah. you know, yes. and bearing in mind that, that women's roles were played by boys or young men, yeah. that I think goes some way to explain all the cross-dressing plots in yes. Shakespeare. It also, in my opinion, goes some way to explaining the ultra-femininity of certain of Shakespeare's heroines. You know, I know that you know that I'm a man, but actually I'm a very, very, very delicate young woman. You yeah, know? Yeah, um, yes, and, you know, yes. the, the implausible femininity to some degree, arguably of Ophelia, of Cordelia, of, of, uh, of Desdemona, and, and, uh, and then them having to be, you know, actresses real actresses who play them having to encounter this and try to bring uh, a, credible, um, a credibility to them, a credible toughness to them. But the, the, um, the characters were, to a large extent, rooted in theatrical reality as opposed to non-theatrical reality. And, uh, and that's what has challenged uh, black actors in the same way it's challenged actresses when, when playing Shakespeare's roles. Yes. You asked a question about interracial Units, didn't you? I don't know if we've quite answered the question that you asked. Well, I, I, I guess just to maybe push my, my, uh, is push my point a little further, that there is a counter-narrative. There is a counter-narrative, which is about the, um, the sexual 
abuse, use and abuse of women of color that is occluded by the obsession with what I call in, in my book, othellophilia. Uh, this, this fixation on this particular paradigm of the black male and the white female, when historically there is, uh, you know, slaveocracy was perpetuated by the reverse going on. Is it possible that there is some kind of deliberate, or, or perhaps not deliberate, unconscious smokescreen going on here? with um, the obsession with this particular paradigm of, of mm -hmm. interracial relations. Um, I mean, I, I happen to think that Antony and Cleopatra is interesting as an interracial love story, mm -hmm. but looking at the historical, uh, looking at the, sorry, the, the, the theater history, mm -hmm. uh, Cleopatra has been per, uh, monopolized, mm -hmm. that role has been monopolized by, um, by white mm -hmm. actresses, mm -hmm. uh, most famously or infamously <laughs> Elizabeth <laughs> Taylor. Uh, so um, I, I, I think um, it's difficult because of everything that has gone on subsequently yes. for us to make sense of that which happened before. Uh, certainly when I used to look at records and I used to see the word Negro, I used to, oh, oh God. <laughs> when I used to see the word Negro, right? He is a Negro. I used to, like this, crawl up, because of how the word Negro was used subsequently. And then when you begin to explore it a little more and you begin to understand that it is a reference to color, and it's from the Spanish word meaning black, and the Latin word meaning black, uh, and you try and separate it from other connotations, you see that it's more a reference to color or origin rather than anything else, initially initially, although in the 18th century, of course, is a reference to mean slave, because a Negro has no citizenship, etc. So when you see it in the 15th century, sometimes you place it in the 18th century. And that's, to a certain extent, inevitable, because we're living in the 21st century. So when you're seeing things from the past, then you keep thinking about things that are happening subsequently, and then trying to make sense of things from the past from your own paradigm which is very difficult when we're trying to work out what was happening in the past and what they really thought. So, for example, the word more that's used, again, is a reference to color, from the Latin word moros, meaning black, the Greek word meaning black, right? Not necessarily a negative reference, could be positive, could be negative, just simply could be a simple reference to the appearance and ethnicity of a person. The word more occurs in English records. People are called a more or sometimes a black -a more. Why do we assume necessarily that it's always a negative inscription? It doesn't have to be a negative inscription. Even in Othello, the play that we are talking about, sometimes it's referenced with something else, like noble more, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't always have to be negative. Of course, it can be, if you wish it to be so, or it can be very comical, like Aaron says, no more, no less, playing on his own ethnicity, his own color, yeah. yes. referencing it. So, so, but the difficulty is to try and look at it without looking at a 21st century perspective. Yes. So when I saw this production of Othello, the reason why I liked it is because on a personal level, though I'm very interested in the play, I've never liked the character of Othello, but I'm very interested in the character of Othello, but I've never liked him as a sense of liking him. Because I always felt actually contrary to opinion that his actual expressions of anger are entirely natural. And the way in which he acts is entirely natural to somebody like him being in the position in which he's in and how he got to be there. And if he's an epileptic or not, actually, I feel he may be. This is some secret that he's been hiding inside of his being, a weakness of character, fundamental weakness of character, perceived by them to be a fundamental weakness of character. Right? Someone who has got into this position would not have got into that position without extreme violence. Without extreme violence. I see him like um, those professional footballers, like O.J. Simpson. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Here we go. Yeah. So O.J. Simpson <laughs> like, um, uh, like, um, like, um, like, uh, or those um, uh, famous uh, actors and comedians who now live rarefied lives within white establishment, like Bill Cosby. Mm. And then suddenly there's revelations about their personal life. Or James Brown or Michael Jackson, or Mike Tyson. See, there's a lot, isn't there? Oh, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> oh, there's a lot, isn't there? Right? Yes, Doesn't yes. mean there's a pattern. 
Does it mean there's a pattern? Right? It means so, we're looking for the pattern. Well, yeah, yeah so the I'm culture saying. is yeah, looking for the pattern. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So I can't, I can't help but have that mind because I'm living in the 21st century. Yes. Whether those reference points are what Shakespeare had, I don't know. But so when I saw this production, I used those reference points. And for me, I like the production because of that. But that doesn't mean that that was in Shakespeare's mind when he wrote the play. Right, well, that, and that's, enough, <laughs> that's a completely yeah. different question. And yeah. maybe there's a good point at which to bring in the audience. Um, we have one very rave review here of the production. Maybe everybody raised their hand almost out there. Um, what I, would, I would love now to hear from some of you uh, with your questions for the panel. Uh, yes, the one American in the audience, thank you. <laughs> and here comes the bright red microphone. I'm glad it's bright wet, red, that helps people to find it. This isn't an American question. Good. It's, it's a question though for Hugh Corshi about Othello. Um, I too have been looking forward to seeing you do it and I'm, I'm glad you did. I'm, I want to ask about your assumptions that there is such a huge difference between the Othello of the first half and the second, because it seems to me that's your starting point in your essay and what you've said again today. What about the fact that this is a man whose opening description of marriage is circumscription, circumscription and confine, mm. who already sees himself as having given something up, who says, rude am I in my speech? Now, maybe that's unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, but who, who says she had eyes and chose me? which suggests that even though he speaks of his background, men of royal siege, to what extent is there some basic insecurity already in the man, whether we go to epilepsy or not, but that those fears about who he is and what he's accomplished are already there. And mm. if they are there, and it seems to me they come out in the real <coughs> soliloquy, not the one at the end, but the one halfway through, happily for I am black, and have not those soft parts of conversation. He's back to, do I sound like everybody else? And then he brings in the thing that he has never mentioned before, which is his age, mm. yes. which it seems to me is, is also part of it, yes. that the older man with the younger wife yeah. is something that is there. I mean, in that sense, could we not say that Iago is smart enough to realize that those cracks may already be mm. in the man's psychology? Yeah, that's, it, it, that's perfectly possible and, and, uh, and quite plausible. Um, my uh, starting point, though, I think, was that um, he, he was a man who was astute enough to know that his future father-in-law would not give his blessing. Now, you, you, you recall in the original short story, um, Disdemona, who is the only character that's named in the Cynthia original, um, her family, though reluctant, they do give their blessing to, to the marriage. Um, but Othello and Desdemona elope because they correctly anticipate that uh, Brabantio is going to object and probably object in the, in, um, in the, in the racist terms that, that, that he does. So that suggests a kind of astuteness. Um, Othello also says in his exchange with uh, Iago, no, Iago. Um, by the way, the emphasis is on chose, for she had eyes and chose, chose me. me. She, it, yeah, it was not, not chose she, me. Yeah, exactly. Chose me, yeah. So she made chose an act me. of choice. Yeah. You know, that's where, that's where the emphasis falls in the iambic pentameter. Um, and he says to Iago, um, no, Iago, I'll see before I doubt, when I doubt prove, and on the proof there is no more but this, away at once with love or jealousy. And now that suggests that this is not a man who is going to resort to sacrifice or murder or honor killing in, in any form, but a man who would actually, the rational thing to do, and it, it seems, he does seem to be a rational man in the first half, would be to divorce Desdemona and send her home in the most um, humiliating terms back to Venice. You know, it doesn't follow that she, but because she's been unfaithful, therefore he should, he should murder her, he, that he should kill her, let alone strangle her in the marital bed. Um, no, the, um, that is the thing that I find uh, most disconcerting, and, uh, and that is the irreducible element of the play which, uh, to my mind, resists the modern idiom that we've imposed on it. Um, the, well, there are a couple of things. One, one is the, the idea of honor killing, which I, I don't know about you, but I associate not with somebody as cosmopolitan 
as, um, uh, as sophisticated, as astute and mature as Othello appears to be in the first half, but I associate that with people who come from less sophisticated agrarian cultures, shall we say. Um, of course, the other thing that resists modernization, perhaps, is the, uh, is the, the role and the um, sub submissiveness of the women. You know, um, tis meet I should obey him, but not now, says Amelia in the, in the final scene. And, uh, and, and get thee to bed that, uh, on the instant. I, I, I will be returned forthwith. I will, my lord, says Desdemona. I mean, that, that is, it's, it's difficult to get a 21st century mindset around that, you know, and that's what perhaps um, uh, is, uh, it's one of those things that we tend to, uh, in my opinion, because there is a, a general assumption that Shakespeare was some sort of humanistic universal genius, we retrofit psychology you know, to, uh, to some, of, some of the most uh, incoherent and contradictory behaviors. Um, he was perfectly possible, perfectly capable of presenting a character who was jealous in Leontes, but we don't for a minute ask, does Leontes behave as he does because he's white? Um, but that question does arise in Othello because there are so few uh, Moorish or black characters in, in the canon and indeed in the Elizabethan stage. Um, well, obviously, sir. Yeah. <laughs> because, because, sorry, because what you have done in your career is to challenge and demonstrate how black people, people of African descent, can play almost any character, yes. Yes. right? And, and in, when you played in Two Gentlemen of Verona, for example, yes. and then we have lines is, you know, like uh, black women or black men of beauty as pearls in ladies' eyes. Suddenly that has a, a reference point, because you're there. Yeah, you're there. Or, or when you're playing Tibble in Romeo and Juliet, um, uh, there's a sudden reference point because you're there. So um, we have characters that are obviously so, and then there are characters, well, we don't know. But you're quite right. As to how they would be played on the Elizabethan stage, it'd be white men. Yeah, but what's, what's in the thinking behind it? You know, why, why can't they be African? Why can't there be women? Why can't there why be, can't anything, they, be anything? Why, be why can't anything they, they be in a be? wheelchair? That's why right. Can, yes. Yeah, so, so, so we have obvious characters where their ethnicity or colour is an obvious reference point. And then we have colour referenced. And colour is referenced throughout all of Shakespeare's plays. Every single play you have has some sort of reference to Rich Jewel and Ethiop's here, Devil Damn Thee Black, all these different terms that are in Shakespeare's plays, from Romeo and Juliet to Macbeth, references to Africans, Ethiopians, Turkish people, Muslims, Christians, goes through. Right? But the point is that now we can play it in the 21st century yes. as anything. But I still go back to, the 20, to that time. And um, I think that because there are few characters, then we look for a perfect character. When I was young, I used to. I said, why doesn't Othello do this? He's so stupid. Why doesn't yeah. Othello do that? He's so stupid. Yeah. Uh, because there isn't um, uh, enough representation. One looks for perfection. And when one doesn't find perfection, one rejects or one destroys. Well, the, the, one may the... destroy. Because, because, then, then, because when we find out, oh, in fact, he has this secret. Oh, in fact, he's actually weak. Oh, in fact, he's very fragile. Oh, oh, we don't want him now. I don't want him now. Where, in fact, we should just take him for the flawed person he that he is. He a person of any... Which yeah. is why the innovative casting of this production is so, um, I think, useful in breaking those uh, assumptions down. There's a hand up in, over in, in the third row from the back. Yes, please. Hello. Um, do you think all of all of you, uh, Othello feels otherized? That he feels otherized. Otherized. Oh, oh. oh. otherized. Uh, um, well, is he othered? Is he? Does he feel like yeah. an outsider? He, Othello. Yeah, yes. Yeah. N not the, the not the play. No. Othello. Well, I, I let, let me start that off. I, yes. I um, at the beginning of this uh, whole the rehearsal process, I, I was um, fortunate enough to be invited to a charity gig where I saw Lenny Kravitz perform. Oh. Um, and he's very charismatic, you know. And he's a great looking guy, very sexy. Um, and I, I was watching him and th I thought, mm, that, that, that could be the way of thinking of Othello, namely as a crossover artist, a mm -hmm. black performer playing to a predominantly oh, white yes. audience. Yes, yes. But the interesting thing was that 
Um, he's got his own style. He doesn't try to fit in. You won't see him dressing like anybody else. He, uh, if anything, people will imitate his style. You know, the, um, Adrian, when Adrian uh, Lester played uh, Othello, he, his first appearance was, I think, in a three-piece suit doing up his cuffs. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> putting, on, putting on his uh, jacket and tie. Um, he was very much part of the establishment. Um, Lenny Kravitz, you know, he don't play that game. Um, and uh, I thought that would be, uh, I, I mentioned it, I referenced him in conversations with Iqbal Khan, the director, and with Fortini, uh, for, um, Fortini Dimu, our, our designer. She took it a stage further and took up and found uh, uh, some photographs of Lenny Kravitz, which goes to some extent to explain my costume in the first act. <laughs> 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 you know, but, um, but, but also the, the, the idea that, um, uh, yes, he might be the other, but he's comfortable with it. You know, and in our Venice, um, as a, a trading hub, inevitably it's going to be a, a multinational, a, a fairly, have a fairly diverse population. <coughs> the difference being, of course, that someone like Othello is, um, is preeminent. You know, I, I was um, once um, invited to a state banquet at Buckingham Palace for, to mark the 50th anniversary of the independence of Ghana. And on arrival, I was asked by the documentary uh, film crew who were making uh, a series about the monarchy, uh, that I was asked why I thought I'd been invited. And I replied, well, I think it's because I'm one of the few Ghanaians working at the BBC who isn't simply cleaning it. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't use they didn't that use bit. <laughs> 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 yeah, but Othello is one of the few people working in Venice who isn't a street sweeper yeah, yeah. or a soldier yeah. or a, a, house, a household servant. You know. By no means. Yes, gentleman in the peach shirt. Here comes the mic. Um, a slight uh, American link again. Uh, how do you place Ira Aldridge in theatrical history? and the casting of Othello. Well, as an early black Othello. Um, well, <laughs> I, I, great. Sorry, I don't understand. Yeah, is it, are you saying his importance or? Yes, his, his importance. Or... Well, I think it's interesting, you know, that we're talking in the 21st century. Mm. We're looking back there to the 19th century with a long period in between where men were blacking up to play the part. Certainly. In fact, um, an interesting thing, as I was saying to Lucien, that um, you might have had productions, even Laurence Olivier's production, Anthony yes. Hopkins' production, all these productions are all white productions of Othello, and um, uh, nobody black on the stage. And now we have a black Othello, a black Iago, might have a Montana. black Desdemona. <laughs> Eventually, you might have no white people on the stage. Right. So, right. So, so we can see an all-black production, perhaps even in reverse. Yes. So the, what I Aldridge did, which is important, is that he tried to claim ownership right. of this yeah. character. Mm. Right? Yeah. Um, he also did the same thing with Aaron in Titus Andronicus. And also, there was another production called The Padlock, right, where he played a, another character, which he took ownership, tried to take ownership of it. So this is part of an idea of gaining ownership of familiar characters that are already within the mainstream for the purpose of, of political and what have you. Well, for the, yeah. er, the early black actors, right. this was quite a triumph. Certainly. Um, yeah, but Paul I, Robeson. Um, but, but, but it did still, there, there was crossover with the blackface mm. continuing. And as, as far as I understand, Patrick Stewart's yeah. reverse photo, so-called yeah, photo negative photo Othello yeah, yeah. <laughs> arose because I learned this from your uh, documentary right. view, your yeah. BBC show. Yeah. Uh, that arose because, in fact, Patrick Stewart wanted mm. to play Othello. But, but also, it, 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 what I on that was that there were a number of other black actors in that production who had played Othello and felt that it was their part, that uh, right. almost as if Shakespeare had written it for them. And now, this seems to me uh, slightly alarming. Um, it would be... Um, I, I can't imagine many uh, distinguished Jewish, Jewish actors queuing up to play Shylock. Shylock. Um, in, in fact, I think quite a few have turned it down over in, in recent years. And it, it's, it seems to me that it's like kind of irony that um, uh, black actors should, should feel that um, they and they alone have uh, ownership of this role. 
um, a role written by a white man for another white man, when, um, when that white actor in black makeup has a line like, her name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as my own face, that's problematic. That suggests a self-hating black man. Um, you will have noticed in our production that's become slightly amended to her name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as thine own face. <laughs> you know. So I mean, I, I think um, that there, there are um, uh, that there is a case for 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 saying that uh, Aldridge um, um, he, he was trying to establish himself in the mainstream. Um, and by, by taking on this role from, it was from, from uh, Keane, wasn't it? And that um, yeah. he was, it also it has to be said, trying, he did to some extent, I think he can be accused of trying to, having tried to sort of ingratiate himself with uh, contemporary audiences. He, for example, changed the, uh, the ending of uh, um, Titus Andronicus to make Aaron a slightly more yeah, sympathetic was. figure. Because yeah. mm -hmm. he, you know, he, he, was, he didn't really want to, to be challenging and provocative and, uh, in, in, in the face of the audience as much as a, perhaps a, a modern black actor would be. So, um, it, you know, um, I, my, um, I think um, uh, my old colleague, Onokachu Wambu, he's, he's one, of, one of those who says, oh, for God's sake, just leave Othello to, to, to the white actors. No self-respecting black actor should play this role. We shouldn't touch it with a barge ball. I don't go that far, but I can well understand why um, some, some people think that this is, as a representation of a black character, um, it's, uh, it doesn't convince, it doesn't satisfy. I'm still, to go back to um, um, this, this, this lady's question here, I'm still, I still struggle with it on a nightly basis. I'm never quite sure whether I've successfully negotiated the transition from part one to part two. You know, now do I see it is true, you know, and that line, We've tried to make it easier in, in this production for me to make that transition by transposing it to a later scene, you know. But um, uh, otherwise, it's it feels too rapid, you know. But it's uh, it's uh, sorry, I just <clears throat> there's there's been a lot of talk about ownership mm. here, and it feels again. I know I'm going back to an earlier point, but the, the, it seems as if there is a we are all subject to. The, the whoever it is that happens to be at the forefront of society culturally, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's uh, sports, that they are the ones who decide what popular imagination uh, is. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's, it seems quite uh, warped that uh, a lot of black actors uh, are hankering after a role that was originally written for a white actor in blackface, yes. which kind of, it's all just very warped. We well, should all just dive in and do everything all together. Well, and actresses, actresses performing roles like Katharina in Taming of the Shrew, mm -hmm. I think we, we can also make a parallel with gender. Mm -hmm. But there's a gentleman back there with a question, I think in the, okay, here comes the microphone. Uh. Well, thank you very much. Um, if we accept that up until the Tudor times, race was experienced predominantly as difference, and it was difficult to define that difference other than that word difference, but if we also accept that by the 17th and 18th century with the development of science, I know, and all the measurement and projection, that through that, we got to a point where the, the word itself, not race, but racism, which could be interpreted somehow as a belief informed uh, by science um, about those differences in terms of people with different kind of characteristics that are actually uh, implanted on, the, on those differences. Can we get back to our original question, which is, is the production or Othello racist? Because what does that actually uh, uh, mean? Um, does it mean, for example, that the play 
projects a, a vast number of differences in, in the different kind of level? Or does it mean the characteristics that are actually played out on stage? Oh, and those are two different questions, which is why the title of our panel is, is Othello a racist play? Not is this current production a racist production? A racist production is... is well, it, I'm just seeking clarity different. on the question uh, it's, it's itself, because of a, as an activist um, who's part of the com community, uh, that sets out to deal with the effects of racism, of racism. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm trying to determine um, what else other than difference or dislike okay. that actually make racism effective. So, so um, if I can unpack your, your question, sir, then, um, your comment and your question, and they're excellent and to the point. Uh, are you suggesting then that there is a certain kind of political danger involved in um, eschewing the term racism because there is some kind of historical disconnect or there's a danger of anachronism since they don't use the same word? You know, racism as a word didn't exist at the time. I, I'm, I'm going back to the point of how things develop. Right, right now, we're seeing the development of a word which until a few years ago was quite, quite ordinary, extreme. We now see a word being introduced, extremism. Um, where are we going with that in the same way that where, where we reach with the word racism? Okay, who yeah, wants um, to tackle that one? I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think um, I, whenever we see something, we observe it from whom we are, right? So you have words on a page but each production that is created is from the imagination that comes from those words. A play is meant to be seen and heard. It's not, just not meant to be read. So the way that it's produced will show whether it is or produce what kind of effects, be it negative or be it positive. Some people on seeing Othello will say this is a racist play, seeing it and hearing it. Right. Other people will say, no, it's not. Now, that's a question, or it could be a question of the production. And then again, it could be a question of what is written on the page, or it could be a question of both. What we're trying to determine is whether it is of both, or is it what is actually written on the page, which is a very difficult thing to determine. Because when a playwright writes something, it's intended to be performed, not just written. Yes, And something performed is quite different to what yes. is written. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely and entirely. And um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, the performance is a space of possibility. And it, it, I think this production works very hard to counter any possibility that, that, this, that Shakespeare's play is going to endorse racist stereotypes. Um, it has Go to ahead. be said, I, 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 there are times um, in, um, particularly in Act 3, Scene 3, when I'm very conscious that we are playing against the grain of against meaning the grain. Of, of, of the text. Mm -hmm. um, exchange me for a goat when I shall turn the business of my soul to such a suffocate and blown surmises matching thy inference. Now the word inference seems to me to suggest that Othello has picked up that Othello, uh, that Iago is talking specifically about Desdemona. But the way that we try to play it is that it comes as a bit of a surprise to him when, when Desdemona is, um, uh, her name is, is linked with Cassio's. Um, um, and and the, the whole thrust of that is that, uh, that there is that problematic line in that scene where Shakespeare has Othello feed Iago the cue that he needs in order to carry yes. on his speech, mm -hmm. and yet how nature, nature erring through from through. itself. Yes. It's a half line. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we took a... Um, uh, a very conscious decision that um, Othello himself is fully aware that he is the template for nature erring from itself. He's perfectly aware that he's older than Desdemona. He comes from a different culture, a different ethnicity, um, um, probably a similar class. But so he, he has no problem about going against nature, which is why Iago's remarks therefore become uh, offensive. Now that's a feature of our production but the conventional interpretations of the play have, Ia have Othello playing along with, with, with uh, Iago's um, um, 
guile, which is what reinforces my point that it is a, a, racist, a play racist by omission than commission. And, and also, I think the way the first scene was handled, uh, Lucian, I think it, the way you handled the racist invective in that first scene, it, it was phenomenal. I never thought the scene could play that perfectly with, because you ironized Iago's racist slurs. It's, yes, it's yeah. a big yeah. joke. He's playing with it. Yes. And, um, but I, you and know, I, I think, again, uh, it, it's, um, it's being in a room and being in a space where we are not bound by tradition, yes, right. by convention, yes. simply by the rigor and the, 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 uh, the scrutiny yes. of our own artistry. Yeah. To go, yes. okay, come on, this is, this is what the line is. Yeah. This is who I am. Let's not pretend. We're not pretending that I'm not this color. This is who I am. Yeah. I am playing Iago. I could tell you a million and ten things that people who are as dark as I am have said that are so nasty. Yes. In casually. That, so, and again, this comes back to my point of who owns the prejudice. Yeah. Who is it that owns the prejudice? And, and who owns you the know? play and as who owns, well? Uh, that 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 space also yeah. requires. A, it, <laughs> there has to be a resistance mm. for this blind reverence for the author of the play, exactly. for that kind yeah. of production to yeah. happen. I, very, very, we're almost out of time, but, but please, sir, uh, uh, go ahead, especially since you're so close to the microphone. <laughs> go for it. Thank you very much. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody here, but it is who owns the play, and the interpretation of this, a fellow, is as good as ever I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. I've never really actually fought it in a, a racist play, but I've always had problems with Titus until the last production of Titus was played in The Swan a year or two back, Stephen Boxer in the title role. The problem I've had, of course, has been Aaron, yes. Oh, yes. which I've always had problems with. But this particular production, I did not have a problem because the Liverpool black actor who played the part did it so well, yes. and because the play was turned, I'm sure some of you saw it, it was turned into a wonderful farce at the end and everything. But afterwards in the pub, the first time I saw it, I had a problem with a Manchester United supporter. <laughs> if you don't mind me bringing some humor, because he thought that to play a Liverpool black actor with a Scouse accent was, in a f was offensive to him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we are out of time, uh, unfortunately. It's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, the next, there will be more of these. Uh, next debates on Sunday, 30th, uh, the 30th of August, are The Merchant of Venice and, I'm sorry, this is the title of the debate, Are the Merchant of Venice and the Jew of Malta anti-Semitic anti plays? Uh, so I, I hope that you are all there. And there'll be information on the uh, RSC Debates webpage about this upcoming debate. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.